I'd like to thank you guys all for being here, embracing the rain, and you know, walking all the way to Anderson in the bad weather conditions. But uh, anyway, so last week we learned a little bit about global warming, thanks to Mike, and uh, some various ways we can reverse climate change. I kind of wanted to take a look at a bit more of a specific segment that is transportation. Um, so I want to take a look at like the brief history of it, um, where we are currently, and kind of where we're headed uh, as a society in the future. Um, so starting off, this is what's widely believed the first ever car, um, originally referred to as a horseless carriage, as you can see by the structures, really just resembles uh, a horse-drawn carriage but without a horse. Um, built in 1886 by Carl Benz, um, fairly impractical at the time, just at a price point of $1,000, that's equal to roughly $100,000 in today's money. Um, so the average person really couldn't buy this. Um, still innovative nonetheless, though. It featured a four-stroke four single cylinder combustion engine capable of putting out two-thirds of horsepower and a top speed of 10 miles per hour. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, so fast. Yeah, so so a little quicker fast. than horse and carriage, roughly, but still fairly uh, impractical. And on top of that, um, it was gasoline, a gasoline engine, obviously, um, and there weren't gas stations on every corner, uh, how there is now. So moving on. Uh, that brings us to the combustion engine, which is really what powers every, like, 99% cars you see on the road today. Um, so it works uh, through a series of explosions, generating high-pressure gases and expanding the space that's above the cylinder, driving the cylinders up and down, in turn driving the crankshaft, and uh, through work of the serpentine bell, sending that energy to the wheels. Um, so yeah, here you can see uh, a four-cylinder engine, uh, cylinders going up and down through the expansion of gases. Um, and the first one was designed in 1864 by Sigmund Siegfried Marcus. Um, really innovative invention. Like I said, it remains largely unchanged in most cars you see today. Um, so next I kind of want to get into sort of the incremental changes that we've seen in our lifetime to the combustion engine. Um, and that begins with forced induction. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the combustion engine works through a series of explosions. Now, uh, before the, uh, the introduction of forced induction, you could increase power by increasing the number of cylinders. Everyone knows a V8 is more powerful than a four cylinder. But now with this, um, you, with an external air compressor, you force more air into the cylinders, allowing for bigger explosions to take place, which in turn generates uh, more power regardless of how many cylinders you have. So the reason it's such a big deal is you don't need more cylinders to have more power, meaning you have a much more efficient engine using less gasoline. Um, current car companies are now rolling out with three cylinder turbo cars. Before, a three-cylinder engine really wouldn't work at all. It would just have no power. But current three-cylinder cars, they, uh, they'll have the best fuel economy of any gasoline engine, and they'll generate similar power to a car with many more cylinders. <coughs> um, so the two most common types of uh, external compressors are turbochargers and superchargers, which you've probably heard of. A turbocharger is usually thought to be more efficient because um, it's powered through your, ga uh, your exhaust gases, which are wasted energy. Um, but your exhaust gases would power a turbine to spin and then suck in air and then force that to the engine. Um, the only problem with that is your engine typically doesn't generate enough exhaust to power the turbine till around 3,000 RPMs. So you'll experience a period of lag when that power isn't really there um, till you get to those higher revs on your engine. A supercharger, on the other hand, is directly connected to your serpentine belt, which, like I mentioned earlier, is driven by the crankshaft. So a supercharger is always spinning proportionally to the engine speed. So there's no lag time uh, that you would experience with a turbocharger. These don't really increase fuel economy, though, just because you're using energy from your engine to power it versus using wasted energy in your exhaust gases to power the turbocharger. So the next incremental change to the combustion engine would be hybrid cars. Um, a hybrid is just the use of two energy sources. So here's a picture of uh, the drivetrain of a Prius. Um, this part here, if you cover it up, this is the combustion engine and then this is the electric motor. That's what majority of hybrids are, an electric motor and a combustion engine. Um, and these are much more efficient because um, during start-stop, the combustion engine is completely turned off using zero gas, and your electric motor is what drives you around. Um, the electric motors get power through regenerative braking, um, getting energy from friction derived from when you slow down, which is really very innovative um, compared to anything else that's come out. Uh, next is electric cars. These are the same exact principle as a hybrid, but just a bigger electric motor and more batteries. Um, the only thing is you can't power the motor solely off of regenerative braking because it's a bigger motor, requires much more energy, obviously. Um, so what you do is you plug it in and charge it similar to 
your laptop or your cell phone. Um, the main drawback with this is the waiting time for charging. You know, a gasoline engine, you squirt the gas in, it takes maybe a minute or two. Um, but they're getting better. Um, so here's the Nissan LEAF. This is actually the first electric car that was really affordable to the average American. Um, brand new, it retails less than $30,000. So very affordable. And here's the Tesla Model S. Um, this is sort of really what paved way for the electric car field, I think, because it designed something that uh, didn't fit that tree hugger image that was really the forefront of green energy, sadly. Um, I mean, just look at the look of this looks way cooler, I think, objectively. On top of that, they made it fast, which really wasn't a thing with green energy. I mean, Priuses are not too fast, the Nissan Leaf isn't very fast. Um, I mean, the new Tesla has two electric motors front and back, capable of combined horsepower of 691. So it's about as fast as a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, um, all without using a drop of gas. Another cool thing they did in the engineering is this whole floorboard is about two inches thick of one giant battery. So your center of gravity is so low that it corners just as good as any uh, supercar versus a traditional electric car which has a stack of batteries under the hood and the motor all under the hood, similar to um, a combustion car. <coughs> so next, um, these are what I consider to be really the long term, um, really the future of our transportation industry for cars, our hydrogen fuel cell cars. Um, so it uses hydrogen as its onboard fuel and the big benefit with that is the only thing it emits is harmless water vapor. So zero greenhouse gases emitted, uh, which is really cool to think about. Um, the main drawback though is hydrogen fuel doesn't naturally occur on Earth as an energy source um, because you have to separate it from everything else um, through like the electrolysis of water and other methods. Um, but right now, it's way too expensive to do that using renewable resources. 95% uh, of the hydrogen energy is made from natural gas. So you could argue that's not the best thing for the environment. Um, another big deal about these cars is, so the fueling station looks just like a gasoline station. You squirt the fuel in and it takes maybe a minute or two the same way you re uh, refuel your gas car versus an electric car where you have to wait for it to charge. Um, so here's a picture of the Toyota Mirai. It's scheduled to go on sale next month in California. Um, only in California because they passed a levy that creates 10 hydrogen fuel cell stations um, throughout the city of Los Angeles. So it's going to go on sale next month for around $60,000, so not quite um, affordable to the average American, but it'll be interesting to see how it does. Next um, are his autonomous cars. Uh, it's a vehicle capable of sensing its environment without any input of a human, so basically a car that drives itself. Um, the energy is, you know, combustion engine or whatever it may be. This is more so just an idea that I think is really cool. Um, a car that can drive itself, you could, there's just so much you could do with this, I think. Um, you know, your time is no longer, like your time getting from point A to point B is no longer a sunk cost. Um, it could be productive, you could take a nap, you could do whatever you wanted on your drive to work. Um, and it's really not as far off as we think. Many companies have promised a self-driving car to be sold on the road um, before the year 2020. So, really interesting stuff. And we've actually been moving towards it for years. Adaptive cruise control, automatic parking, blind spot monitoring, those are all features that are available in cars that the average American can buy today. Um, but yeah, so moving on to some of the benefits, uh, you'd have fewer collisions because computers have a better reaction time than humans. Um, you could also facilitate higher speed limits. You know, you could drive twice as fast if you're not driving the computer is. Um, but I guess some of the drawbacks worth mentioning would be the reliability. Um, computers aren't perfect, we all know. And then the liability, how, do, how would car insurance companies adapt to this? If you're not the one driving, who's liable if it crashes? Um, and then the loss of jobs, I think, is worth mentioning too. You know, Uber drivers, taxi drivers, buses, those jobs really wouldn't exist if cars could just drive themselves, I believe. So that's a picture of the Mercedes F015. That's a, it's actually a concept car right now. They don't have a release date set for it, but it's actually, um, they've been testing around San Francisco and various other high traffic cities. Um, having the car drive itself. And then that's a car from Google actually two years ago that they were testing um, around their headquarters up in Mountain View, California. So really interesting stuff and it's not as far away as you would think. Next we move away from cars <coughs> and move to what is called the Hyperloop. Um, this is a theoretical <coughs> idea of a high speed transportation system. Um, so envision a pod in a vacuum um, blasted really fast. So it works similar to a rail gun and an air hockey table. So very low uh, friction, uh, low air resistance, and it's powered through um, air compressors. So the big deal with this is not only is it efficient, but it's faster than anything we've ever had. Um, the 
theoretical route is from Los Angeles to San Francisco in about a half hour, which is the equivalent of uh, Columbus to Chicago in about a half hour, which, I mean, a plane takes at least double the time, which is the crazy thing, I think. Um, and being more efficient than any other form of transportation, it not only would be faster, but also cheaper. So um, the implications you would be uh, would be just drastic, I think. Um, some of them would be you could live so far away from where you work, you could live uh, 400 miles away from where you work. So that would really change things up, I think. I guess the main drawback, though, is the proposed cost of the infrastructure is you know seven and a half billion dollars. So. Who's going to pay for that? I think is the main question there. Next, a company worth mentioning is SpaceX. Um, it's currently the only private company that travels to space. Um, so the real goal is to make space travel more affordable through the use of reusable rockets. Um, up until this point, when you take a rocket to space, it kind of disintegrates. You can't use it. So with these rockets, you use them, and then they parachute back down, and you can keep reusing them, really making it a lot more affordable. This again is founded by Elon Musk. Um, his, en his end goal with this is the colonization of Mars. So that's kind of a whole other topic rather than transportation. But fun fact about SpaceX, they're currently more profitable than Tesla. Um, right now they function as sort of the FedEx of space. So they fly up and deliver supplies like the International Space Station. So pretty interesting company. Next is uh, jetpacks. These are more of always been just a concept idea, uh, conceptualized in the 1920s. So we really don't have them today just because they're not too efficient. Um, like the idea of wanting to fly without the principles of aerodynamics is just not efficient. Um, so currently the one jetpack that's commercially available is the Martin jetpack and it retails for 120 grand, but it's more so just a toy than anything else. Um, it's actually powered by a four cylinder gasoline engine. Um, it's got a 13 gallon fuel tank and you can go 32 miles. So really just not efficient, more so recreational. Uh, but I figured I'd include it because I always thought they were pretty cool. So thanks for listening. Um, I kind of wanted to end with a quote that I've always liked. Um, this is by Lane Gretzky, the hockey legend. It's, I skate where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And that's sort of the idea we really want to um, foster with our club here is just to get you guys thinking about the future and, you know, not the past, but the future. So thanks for listening. <laughs> nice, Kurt. Sweet. All right, so if you want to take a minute, you guys can like uh, go to the bathroom, get something to drink, get something to eat, and take Have a minute to discuss.